Boa tarde. O meu nome é Alfonso, and today I would like to discuss about an important moment in Portuguese history. That moment stake the Portuguese freedom on the line during the medieval times, and it is the Battle of Aljubar Hota. It was fought in 1385 between the Kingdom of Portugal and the Kingdom of Castile. Now, what's the prelude to the battle? The story goes like, near the end of the 14th century, the death of King Dom Fernando I de Portugal without leaving a male heir to succeed him plunged Portugal into a state of interregnum that will be known as Trise Dinastica or the dynastic crisis of 1383 until 1385. From his marriage to Leonor Teles de Menezes, only a daughter, Princess Beatriz de Portugal, survived. She was to be married to King Juan I de Castile, she was 9 years old at the time, in order to cease the existing hostilities by a union of the two crowns. This solution, however, was not popular and not even widely welcomed by the nobles, the common people, and the powerful merchants of Lisbon because it would effectively result in Portugal losing her own independence to Castile. Thus, they turned into two potential candidates to succeed the throne. Both of them are illegitimate sons of Pedro I de Portugal and half-brothers of Fernando, Joao, son of his lover Inés de Castro, and Joao, master of Avis. Joao de Avis and his faction stirred up many troubles, including killing the Count Andero and gaining the title Protector of the Realm. This prompted the Castilian king to retaliate by sending a punitive expedition in 1384. However, they were crushed by a much smaller Portuguese army at the Battle of Atoleros. Soon after that, Juan I led a larger second expedition himself that reached and managed to besiege Lisbon for four months in the summer of 1384 before being forced to retreat by a shortage of food supplies due to the constant harassment from Nuno Alvarez Pereira, a young and skilled commander, and the bubonic plague known as Black Death which still spread periodically across Europe. In 1385, Joao de Avis organized the Cortes de Coimbra, also known as the Assembly of Coimbra Cortes, meaning assembly attended by nobles, members of the church, the clergy, and the bourgeoisie in order to secure his claim. The assembly declared Joao as the king of Portugal, which made Juan I infuriated and decided to march straight to Portuguese lands to conquer them with a huge army of 31,000 men. Joao de Avis, on the other hand, only had around 6,600 men available at his command. Consequently, Rather than waiting for a siege at Lisbon, he and Nuno Alvarez Pereira, now the Condestado de Portugal, decided to openly confront the Castilians, setting up defenses near the parish of Aljubar Jota in the small flattened hilly terrain called San Jorge, surrounded by creeks. And thus, in the morning of 14th August, around 10 o'clock in the morning, the army of Joao I took its position at the north side of the hill facing the road where the Castilians would soon appear. The stationing of the troops was as following, dismounted cavalry and infantry in the center with archers occupying the flanks, notably on the vanguard's left wing, later covering the left flank on the battlefield. A company composed by some 200 unmarried young nobles is remembered to history as the Alados Namorados, and the right wing also 200 strong known as Ala de Madre Silva, or the Hanisako flank, albeit they didn't achieve the same heroic fame as the former. On either side, the army was protected by natural defenses, creeks and steep slopes, and the reinforcements were positioned in the rear, commanded directly by Joao I de Portugal. Soon after, the Castilian army arrived from the north on the battlefield around midday. Juan saw the Portuguese entrenchments, and after his scouts told him that the south side of the hill had a gentle slope, Juan opted to attack from the south, where the hill was much easier to charge on. In response to this movement, the Portuguese army hastily inverted its dispositions and headed to the south slope of the hill. General Nuno Alvarez ordered the troops to construct a system of ditches, pits, and call troops. Luckily for the Portuguese, the battle would soon commence and the enemies are overly tired from the march. 
One of Castile started the battle by ordering the French ally heavy cavalry to charge in full strength with the purpose of shattering order in the enemy lines. The attack, however, was a catastrophic failure thanks to a heavy rain of bolts and arrows combined with uneven terrain crossed with obstacles that virtually reduced the charge momentum. Juan I, trying to mend his mistake, decided to reinforce the cavalry by directing the main body of his army forward. Nevertheless, they were late, and some knights that did not fall in the battle were taken as prisoners. Joao I, who saw this advancement by the Castilian army, ordered the English longbowmen to retire and advance with the rear guard through the space open between the vanguards. The Castilian army, who were advancing uphill with the heat of the sun on their backs, and under, and under a heavy rain of English longbowmen's arrows, began to fight fiercely. Even the Castilian knights who were trapped in the main body of the Castilian army were forced to dismount and break their lines in half and thus fight on foot. The constricted melee soon caused significant casualties for both sides, but the Castilian rear knights couldn't utilize their full potential nor could they flank the enemy as they lost much of their cohesion moving through ditches and pits disorganized just like French allies half an hour earlier. In comparison, Portuguese units held the line firmly and dealt serious damage, slowly gaining an upper hand despite the losses on their own side. By sunset, an hour after the battle had started, the Castilian position was indefensible and when the disheartened rear troops saw the royal banner at the front had fallen, they thought that the king was dead, and thus they started to flee in panic, which became a widespread route where Juan Primero had to run hastily to save his own life. He, as a king, left behind many common soldiers and other dismounted noblemen, only for themselves to be slaughtered by Portuguese troops who chased them off down the hill whilst there was still sufficient light to see and discern the enemy. There was even a legend that, during the rout, an enormous baker by the name of Brites de Almeida found and killed eight Castilian soldiers as they were hiding in our bakery after the battle. Other than the national spirit of Portuguese people that swiftly defeated the spirit of chivalry brought on and carried on by the Castilian and the French knights, the Portuguese were also noted to utilize the English defensive military tactics, of which the tactics had proven their own might once again, in particular against the heavy knights of France. Back then, France and England were engaged in the Hundred Years' War, when the English heard that the French were going to send their own contingents to help the Castilians, the English did the same to the Portuguese. The aftermath of the battle was that King Dom João I de Portugal founded the town of Batalha, jointly with the monastery of Santa Maria da Vitoria na Batalha, to pay homage to victory at Ajuda Rota. The Portuguese victory in this battle gave Portugal a chance to maintain her own independence as a free nation and made possible her development as an exploring and a colonial power in the age of great discovery. And lastly, the Anglo-Portuguese alliance that had started around 10 to 12 years earlier was ratified again in 9th of May 1386 and is now currently the oldest alliance in the world, still being enforced to this very day. My name is Alfonso, I hope this information is useful to all of you. Thank you for listening. Obrigado. Terima kasih.